You are listening to episode number 28 of the Happy Choir Podcast. <laughs> Hola, people. I am Carlos Cordero, host and creator of the Happy Choir Podcast, helping you connect with others through choral music. I'm really excited about today's episode because we have with us Brandon Elliott. He is a musician, educator, arts leader, and consultant for both higher education and the music industry. Brandon is here today to talk about his journey as a founder and artistic director of Choral Arts Initiative. I hope you're ready for this amazing interview. But before we go there, I want to remind you the ways that you can help the Happy Choir podcast. You can leave a review in iTunes, you can share it with a friend, or you can go to patreon.com slash composer cordero and help us there for as little as three dollars a month. Your support means everything to us. And now let's listen to Brandon Elliott's interview. And in today's episode in the Happy Choir podcast, as a big storm is outside my office, is Brandon Elliott. Welcome, Brandon. Hello. By now, I will have introduced you and all that you do in the choral arts, which is awesome. But I always love to hear from you itself your story in music and how you started in choral music. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, how I started in choral music is actually, I consider it to be a fun story and um, I love sharing it with my students now. So I actually had no choral experience whatsoever until high school. And when I first started singing choral music, I hated it. And I actually fell into choral music by accident in high school. I was actually on the cross country team, which was a non-cut sport. And yet I managed to get cut from the team because I was just not a fast runner. And so my freshman year, I'm cut off the team. And my vice principal said, all right, well, we've got to put you in two classes to fill in all of the credits that you're losing from not being in a sport. So he said, I basically can put you in two classes. It's going to be the bass chorus and it's going to be intro to computer keyboarding. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so I showed up to bass chorus two weeks into the semester as a freshman and absolutely hated it. But over the course of time, I had my great high school choral teacher, Rich Messenger, who's still a great friend and mentor of mine today, uh, fell in love with it. And so by the time I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to be a choral director and I knew I wanted choral singing to be a part of my life. Was that the first time, the first encounter with music, or did you play any instrument? Uh, yeah, so that wasn't necessarily my first encounter with music. So I know that uh, when I was a younger child, I had some lessons on and off on piano and guitar, but I admittedly never took it seriously. And uh, to a certain extent, it kind of functioned as extended daycare for me. My mother worked very long hours as a single parent back then, And so it was kind of like once the after school care ended at five, I had to do something after five o'clock. Uh, and so it was often just going to some sort of after school music program. Uh, but again, I never really took it seriously. So I, I don't really consider my music studies as something that started until high school. That's the first time I learned things like this is a G on a treble clef. And it's amazing to then hear that story because I've heard so many people that says that a teacher then changed you know, their view of music because they guided them, they helped them to not only understand, but also learn how to express and to enjoy this choral music or another instrument. Do you feel that, how, how, how did it help you uh, to be in the choir, not only you know for your credit, but also in your life? Do you feel that you grew as a student? Oh, in so many ways it was so beneficial. I mean, Yeah, I mean, what I really appreciated about Rich, my high school choral director, is he really prioritized musicianship. So even in the bass course, which was the beginning choir for all basses and tenors at the time, uh, every single rehearsal started with sight singing. Every single rehearsal. That's awesome. We knew the drill. We would walk into class, we would grab our Melodia books out of the shelves, and uh, Mr. Messenger would call out excerpts and say, what's the key? What's the time signature? Here's your starting pitch. Sing. Now, of course, that didn't happen right on day one. He built the skills up, you know, teaching yeah. how to determine key signatures beforehand. But mind you, for me, when I came in at the end of week two, 
the students already had that knowledge. So they were, here were this group of guys that were all sight singing and I had no idea what a note on the staff was. So it was kind of a, a rude awakening for me, but I'm so grateful for that musicianship training. And then also we have to consider the strong benefits of social connection. You know, I went into a high school with not many friends up to that point. And by being a part of the choral program there, I had so many friends, some of whom I still keep in touch with today. How awesome. It happened to me too when I got uh, first at university, actually, uh, to acquire. I didn't have, you know, many people in, I used to study med school, in med school. And I didn't have many friends there, but when I went to rehearsal in the choir, that uh, then I found my group there, and then I spent just you know three hours every day <laughs> there in the rehearsal. So yeah, it can be great to not only find the music but also the community that help us there. So that's awesome. Absolutely, and you know the community aspect is so important. And I'll admit that over the years, both as a choral singer and as a conductor of choirs. I have personally lost sight of how important that is. Like I've taken it for granted and I've only recently realized this as a result of, you know, this pandemic with coronavirus yeah. where all of a sudden I no longer get to be with my choirs. My, my students no longer get to sing with one another and we're all feeling that social disconnectedness and it's helped us all realize, gosh, choral music is so much more than making beautiful music. That social connection That family is so important, and we're all missing that right now. Yeah, and I feel somehow that this is just a big reminder of because you go so you go to something weekly, you know, rehearsals. You study your music, you go to rehearsal, you sing the concert, and then repeat. And then sometimes that can get that can get a little mechanic, and we forget. Yeah. But definitely, as you say, this is just a big wake up call of oh, there are these other million things that I'm missing, not only singing with everybody, but also the time that I get to see people and talk and, I don't know, just absolutely feel the, yeah, feel the company of everybody. Have you been able to keep in touch with uh, the people that you teach and the people that you uh, are inquired with? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of wear two main hats. So the first is at Moore Park College. The other is at Choral Arts Initiative. With Moore Park College, we're basically meeting at our regularly scheduled rehearsal times online via Zoom. Now, obviously, like most choral conductors have realized, it's it's pretty much, I hate to say the word impossible, it's fairly impossible to recreate what happens in person as far as choral singing and rehearsal on Zoom. So what we do is kind of split the difference where we're actually working on a new piece by Dale Trambor, which is intentionally composed for a chorus is singing on Zoom. It accounts for the lag time. And it's it's really fun. We just workshopped it yesterday, actually. Uh, but what I'm doing with the choirs at Moore Park with the students is giving them a little bit of time literally to just socialize because they're not getting that. So allowing some time in class to just, all right, what's going on in our lives? What's, what do we want to talk about? Like literally yesterday we were talking about baking and how hard it is to get flour to bake right now. Uh, and then we'll do things like we'll do more musicianship work uh, where they'll sight sing, uh, they'll sight read rhythms, whatnot. So we are having that regular contact time. It doesn't replace being together in person, but we're doing our best to make uh, good of a really unfortunate situation. With Choral Arts Initiative, uh, we actually had to postpone one of our concerts. And so we had our final rehearsal three weeks ago together. And sadly, I have not seen them since. So I won't see them probably until May when we try to pick up rehearsals again. And of course, safety is a priority. So if May yeah. comes around and it's still not safe to rehearse together, then we're just going to have to make that judgment call at that time. Yeah, I completely understand. And as you say, safety is always the best. And But I'm glad, you know, as you're saying, it feels now that we are then reinforcing that other social part that choir is because you know we can just decide and that's also totally okay to just decide to okay let's stop and let's see let's figure out what's happening with this time and how we can create some sort of choral experience because as you say it's not fully choral but somehow you're taking the details that you can do via this tool online and just use those little parts, as you say, 
talking about the social time, sharing, keeping the connection between the community that you've already built because then that can still happen. And I feel like that's something very precious to take care of. Right. And, you know, for the students, it just gives them something dependable to count on because I don't know about you, but there's some times where I just feel like I'm going crazy just staying in home oh all my day God, for, yeah. for days on end. And so... <laughs> At least it gives them just that two hours twice a week to look forward to, to just reconnect with people, crack some jokes, you know, build community. It's a, uh, it's been, a, even for me personally, it's been something to really look forward to every single week. Well, you know, and my husband is a conductor, I'm a composer. And for me, for example, has been an interesting time because I already worked from home, you know, writing music and building my brand right here in my office. But I can see how, It affects me to not have the output of the social time, I'm starting to feel claustrophobic here, <laughs> taking more walks, etc. But for him, for yeah. example, he's always said, you know, I'm a conductor and without the voices, without the choir, you know, I would just be moving my hands. Yeah. So now he's living more that uh, not being able to reach uh, the people in person. So right. it's such an interesting thing. And uh, I feel it's amazing that the whole world is, or most of the world is, under this. Hey, people. I want to take a quick second to tell you how your support makes a difference. When you support me on Patreon.com, you are not only giving $3 a month, but you are giving my brand a boat of confidence. This translates to helping several other artists to connect through choral music. Think about it as a cup of coffee that you invite me once a month. Only that is way more impactful and personal. Plus you get to be part of the behind the scenes of my career as a composer, with the many perks that I shared in there. Even if you're not able to give right now, your support listening to this podcast is great, even more if you leave a review in iTunes. Patreon.com slash Composer Cordero is the link that you want to visit or share with others. Hope to see you there. Getting back to the story of how then you became a conductor, a musician, and what happened after high school? Do you went right away to college for music? Yeah, so, you know, I kind of, I, even though I knew I wanted to do music in high school, there was always that lingering thought like, you know, oh, I don't know if I'll make money or a career out of this. Maybe I should look into something else. So I actually started off in a law enforcement career trajectory. And uh, it sounds so completely foreign to me now. And when I think, when I tell people this, like, wait, what? You went from law enforcement to choral music. Uh, but so I actually dabbled in that for quite a bit, but I was still going to college full time at Cal State Fullerton with uh, Dr. Robert Isad and Dr. Christopher Peterson and was working towards my music ed degree uh, there. But I was also studying criminal justice um, and was working uh, for the uh, Irvine Police Department, actually, wow. in Orange County, California. So I was kind of throughout my entire undergrad kind of on the fence of do I want to commit to, you know, I could have, if I wanted to, just dropped out of college and become a full-time salaried uh, personnel in law enforcement. But I decided I really wanted to stick with the music track uh, and then got my credential student taught for the year and just decided, you know what, I need to go to grad school. There's just so many more questions that I have. There's so much more knowledge I want to gain. So I went on to grad school at the Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music with Dr. Brett Scott and Dr. Rivers. Had a fantastic time there and uh, wound up right after graduating, getting the job at Moorpark College back in California. How wonderful. And I like how you say that there were more questions, there were more things that you wanted to experience and the fact that you went for it to to keep developing it's great because you know for many times it's it's hard as you say you know we when we go to these degrees we think okay am i going to make money am i going to be able to live for me being a composer uh i didn't start as a composer i was a singer first and then i make the ch the shift to composition and there was always that question even the question not only financially but also calling myself an artist So that all of the doubts can be there present for us to drop, as you say, at, at any time and then say, okay, I'm just going to get this job and do that. But I really like that you went for it and that you could then 
how do you, will you say in English? Like gather the fruits. <laughs> you know, you got the job and then you got. Oh yeah. When in your story then came um, founding Coral Arts Initiative? Is this something that came later, or you always knew that you wanted to do? Yeah. No, it was kind of. It wasn't something I always wanted to do. To be very clear, it was. Um, you know, when I was gearing up to get footage together for grad school auditions for all the pre-screens and whatnot, mm -hmm. I had to basically assemble a choir uh, and put on a concert. And I just decided, all right, well, let's assemble a concert uh, or let's assemble a choir. We'll put on a concert and let's identify some sort of local charity that we can just give the proceeds to, you know, might as well support some local organization. Uh, so we put together the concert and it was just really fun. And so, um, nothing came of it. The concert ended and that was that, but then there was that lingering thought for me that, huh, this might be something that could be like a regular thing. And I kind of just left it at that. Um, got uh, moved to Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, started grad school, and then really started reaching out to a few of my closest friends still in California saying, Hey, I've been really thinking about what if we started this choir and I don't want it to just be a choir that puts on, you know, the typical program that we expect. I really want us to focus on new music because at the time in Orange County, there was a there was very little new music, new choral music presence in Orange County. And so I thought I really want that to be our focus. And so one thing led to another and uh, we founded the organization. I founded the organization in the chorus when I was still in grad school, which in retrospect, I probably should have waited because <laughs> it was a lot of work to be a full-time grad student and be running an organization. Uh, and getting it from the ground up. But uh, so it started in 2012, 2013. We had our first concert officially as Coral Arts Initiative in the summer of 2013. I was just about to ask, and congratulations for that, because as you say, just just being a uh, grad student is already <laughs> work enough to be able to, you know, stay sane and sleep some hours. So <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that uh, adding, building an entire organization that's also a you know, acquire because then all the schedules, all the time, you know, all of the little things that go into putting together a concert, it's, it's very, it's a lot of work, but I'm glad that it happened because then it has been able to do it for all of these years and uh, so successfully. Well, uh, Dale Worland, who's, you know, funny connection with Dale Worland, uh, Dale Worland did an artist residency at California State University Fullerton Um, when I was still a student there and they needed someone to basically be his right hand man for anything, picking him up from the hotel, driving him to the school, anything he needed from getting him his favorite dry cappuccinos to getting him number one pencils, whatever it was, I was that guy. And as a result of that residency over the week, just developed a really great friendship and mentorship with Dale from uh, Moreland. And so um, ever since then, he's been a, a great mentor that I can call or email. And when I told him I wanted to start a chorus, he was very supportive of it and, uh, you know, gave me some some tips, some words of wisdom. And so anyway, long story short, I founded the chorus. All the paperwork was done. We got our 501c3 status. We had our first concert, called Dale to tell him how great it all was. He goes, Brandon, I need you to understand something. What you just did will be the easiest part of starting a chorus. Oh, wow. It's like, what do you mean? I thought that this was the hardest work to fill out <laughs> all that paperwork. He goes, anyone can start a choir. Not many people can sustain a choir in an organization over multiple years. So he said, you got through the easiest part. Starting a choir is easy. Sustaining a choir is where the work begins. And I'll never forget that advice and that, that insight, because sure enough, When I look back, even though it felt like the hardest work at the time to start a chorus, that was so easy in comparison to now where it's sustaining and strategic planning and donor relations and all the different things that we have to consider to keep the organization sustainable and healthy and thriving. I mean, it's an amazing statement and advice because it also speaks of the constant effort that you have to keep doing, like a relationship, right? Not only, yeah. you know, getting up the energies to then forming the choir but also okay now you cannot go to sleep now you can you have to work 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 to keep the organization alive and growing and uh was there do you feel at any point during that time that what 
let me think about the word that you had the the permission i guess it's a word or did you have the means to do the course because you know not every graduate student might feel that uh they have the oh, i'm missing the word the power i guess <laughs> to create a course for themselves they might think oh no this is for people that are far along in advancing their career yeah Um, I certainly didn't get any sort of pressure from my professors at CCM. There was nothing like that. There was a little bit of a concern where, you know, maybe you shouldn't take this on while you're also a graduate student. But in general, it was sort of what I would call neutral support. Um, but that said, I did feel a lot of pressure and I did encounter a lot of imposter syndrome and imposter phenomenon because there was this part of me that felt that, you know, maybe I'm just really underqualified to do this. Who am I? to start a course, who the heck is going to want to be a part of this organization? How the heck am I going to get donors and grants to support this? But ultimately what it was for me is, you know, the mission and the vision was already established. And so that was my North Star. It wasn't about me, right? So it wasn't about, do I feel like I have permission? Do I feel like I have the ability? It was more about, this is a mission vision. I'm going to give it my best shot. If it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, fortunately, you know, eight years later, it's still working or excuse me, nine years. Yeah. Eight years later, still working. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely did feel a little bit of that imposter syndrome kicking quite a bit. And even still to this day, to be completely transparent, sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me with composition. <laughs> <Anytime>. <laughs> yeah. Still learning, honestly. Yeah. And the, well, the fact that you say you then were able to separate yourself from the, project you know it's not anymore am i able to do it but this project this project exists and uh, it has a mission and a vision that i want to fulfill that i want to help fulfill with all of this um did you have a team by, by that time or were you by yourself yeah so we had a working board at when okay. we first started but we had no staff so It was, I mean, it was just all me and, you know, their, the board would help out where they could. Like one of my colleagues, Jeff was incredibly helpful in the starting phase with all of the operational type things, you know, the venues, setting up all the different stuff, but it was a lot of work when it first started up uh, because like most founding artistic directors, you're doing a lion's share of the work. You're the development yeah. associate. You're the you're the marketing and publicist director. You're the artistic director. You're the executive director. And it's a lot of hats to wear. Now, fortunately, in year eight, we've got an executive and development associate. We've got a marketing and publicity director. We've got an admin assistant, an assistant conductor, uh, and, a, and, and a board as well. So We've expanded over the years, but the first few years, it was a lot of bootstrapping and a lot of me wearing multiple hats. Do you feel that then this expansion came as a necessity or was something that you planned that was inside the plan? Uh, I would say it was a mixture of both. Some of it was necessity and some of it was part of our strategic planning. That's great because, you know, sometimes we can feel that we have to do everything by ourselves, but... And as yeah. you said, you know, artistic director at the beginning, it's a very broad description of a, of a job yeah. in a founding yeah. organization. So it's awesome that uh, you were able to then look mm, ahead, I guess. It's what I want to say, because you can decide to just stay and do the whole work uh, yourself. But then you realize that you have a job to do, which is the artistic director. And that there are many other uh, people that can help you to fulfill all of the other things that you are trying to solve uh, in the way. So that's awesome because then you see how the organization is growing. Right, and I'll you know I'll speak for myself. I and maybe other founding artistic directors can you know consider this. But like we talked about earlier, the organization is not about me. It's also not my organization, right? So part of our strategic planning from very early on was that we have to build the capacity so that if for some reason, let's just say I die today, the organization needs to have the capacity to continue on and to continue its mission and continue the pursuit of its vision. So we need to have that staff capacity so that there is continuity plans in case something happens to me or you know, who knows what could happen. There's so many things that could happen. So Part of it was we needed to have incremental increase in staff capacity so that there is continuity in case something happens to me. Because I find that 
you know, as the founding director, I kind of was holding on to a lot of the responsibilities. And there was a brief period of time where I was quite ill. Um, this was about three years ago. And, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, it's all because of me. But um, there was a brief period of time where the organization went through a bit of uncertainty and kind of fell behind because I was very sick. And a lot of the work was being done by me. And that was a huge wake up call for me that this can't all be about me. This can't all be revolving around me as far as the work and the capacity. Um, so it's really important to build that. And that's why we've been over the course leading up to our year 10, which is coming up soon, expanding our staff capacity, expanding the roles and responsibilities so that there is strong continuity moving forward. And I love that idea too, because it both both show that you don't have to have all of the pressure that it's all me, it's all me, because there's a team and there is yeah. a bigger picture here. You know, it's not, because if not, you will have created an organization uh, that's you, you are... Uh, You know, the donors will support you to make music with people instead of being core yeah. arts in initiative. So that's uh, that's a wonderful thing to learn from your experience. Do you feel mm, as you develop this organization with the board and as you get also stuff, was there any challenge that you feel in the as you build this organization that was very difficult to manage? Honestly, yeah, there's so many challenges. Every year there are new challenges. And um, like I would say, one of the year. most recent <laughs> ones is, oh, in this past year, I would say the most recent one is we hired two new staff. We hired an assistant conductor and we hired uh, an executive and development associate. And of course, by bringing in more staff, that means that our board, which in a few years ago was used to being a working board, now has less of a working role and is more of just a governance role. So there's that transition, which was difficult for some board members that, you know, they felt like some of the ownership was being taken away from them. And what I had to explain to them is that none of that has changed. It's just you're moving more towards a governance role, which is really what a board should be. So there was that transition. Another one, which is most recent, I'll be very transparent, is uh, our assistant conductor, Daniel, who is fantastic. I love working with him. It was a transition for the choral artists to be like, wait a minute, where's Brandon? Because <laughs> intentionally, I would not go to some rehearsals because um, in the fall, I'll be taking a sabbatical from Choral Arts Initiative. So this most recent cycle, I was intentionally phasing out how many rehearsals I went to to have Daniel go to more of them so that they can get used to working with him. And so that also Daniel feels like he's at full autonomy to then take over in the fall. But it was a big adjustment for the singer. So that was another thing to work out is um, working through that transition. So I'd say those would be two big challenges from this past year. You know, and the trust that goes with it is also a big challenge. And I love, you know, that you then offer the space for everybody in this process to learn, you know, for you to learn to give space to others, but also for others to feel that they can then come and work And that's such a, I feel it's a healthy organization. Yeah, it, I think it was the, you know, when I think back, I think it was the right call. But of course, there was some concern like, well, where's Brandon? And, you know, <laughs> where, shouldn't he be here? And, uh, and, I, and I feel that. But at the same time, what I didn't want is to go on a sabbatical and fall and then have be, you know, Daniel's first time, you know, working with the choir for an extensive period of time. I didn't want that. And that would have been pretty catastrophic for the choir. So uh, doing this phase in process, you know, it's, it's had some, it's had some challenges for sure. Yeah. Good transition. As you look back on the organization from now, do you feel that you've built what you envisioned or that you are still creating and finding the organization that you dream? Yeah, I think it's a constant build. I don't think I don't think uh, there's a final destination. I think you know the way the way I've approached it is there is no final destination. You know, excellence is not a final destination. It's a daily habit, and um, innovation is not a destination. It's a daily habit. It's a cultural thing that we foster in our organization. So no, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we ever will be like you know in giant air quotes done or we will have, quote, made it. So for us, we're constantly innovating. We're constantly, uh, when we have our strategic planning meetings, we just fill this huge whiteboard. It's like, where are we? 
where do we want to go? How do we get there? And we're, we're a small enough organization where we're nimble. If we realize, you know what, we don't like the direction we're going, we can change on a dime pretty quickly because we have a small organization and, and we have the resources and that nimbleness, that flexibility to make you know, very quick adjustments, of course, if necessary. So I would say for us, no, I don't think it's anywhere where I envisioned it would be eight years ago in the best of ways. That's awesome. And I love what you said because I never thought about that. When you are an organization that is not, you know, it's a huge, like, let's think a symphony or let's think uh, yeah. uh, just a, a choir that has been, I don't know, 880 years around. Uh, you can then create these changes uh, and be able to take risks and be able to just experiment and see what's the direction that you want to go. Because, you know, sometimes... People can get caught up on these uh, ideas thinking that they might fail or that they are a failure or, or that they have to be more strict about where they are going or thinking that they are just too small and that they are not accomplishing anything. But I love how you also bring these uh, ideas of there are some positive sides of being a small organization and still constantly thriving because if and if anybody of the, our audience are listening right now haven't you know listened to your performances or going through your website i mean i recommend it to go now because they are amazing i'm still yet to listen to chorus live out and i can't wait <laughs> but <laughs> the but I, I, yeah i mean i i love and now that i'm learning more about the organization it's just amazing what Uh, you've built here. I just want to quickly remind you that all of the links that are mentioned in this episode will be in the show notes in the happychoir.com slash podcast or find it in the description of this episode. Also, once you are there in the website, you can subscribe to the newsletter. This will come with a $20 discount for your next choral recording, a free guide that I've created just for you on the things that I've discovered in my career on how to be a happy composer, conductor, or singer. You will also receive a weekly email with podcast episodes, blog posts, and music. I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to this episode. As a artistic director, what's the most exciting or fun thing that you get to do? You know, for a new music ensemble, the most exciting thing is everything's new. Like every every piece that we're programming or commissioning or premiering, you know, it's all new. And so there's never like, I, I, there's never like an end to the learning process. It's just you're constantly being exposed to new composers. You know, every time I think I know every living composer there is, I learn about 10 more. And so it's just so fun and exciting for me to, one, get to just explore all the music that's out there, the vast diversity of, of choral music that's out there now more than ever, I think. And it's just such an exciting time to probably be a composer, but also to be a choral conductor. But then also it's exciting in the sense that every concert we put on, to have that satisfaction, that intrinsic motivation and that intrinsic reward of I'm bringing something that is brand new to life. And more often than not, we have the composer there with us or the composers. And to see the joy in their face, to see the exuberance in their face, to see an audience that gives them a standing ovation, to see a chorus that has that passion to bring it to life. That's the best feeling in the world. That's great. And I'm sure you also uh, think of this because... You know, many people sometimes might say, no, the chorus or the uh, conductor are translators, you know, but I feel, and this is one of my favorite parts of chor choral music, that we get to work as a team, at least for me as a composer, uh, when I do something new and also with other pieces, when I get to work with a chorus and I hear, you know, what they're bringing to the piece, And if they say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" or "What do you?" or we feel that we want to do this, I say, "Go, go for it," because you know, as you're saying, you're doing something new, and you're creating your 
performance of it. Yeah, and that's what we love about working with composers is we have them, you know, join us. And some composers are actually really kind of uh, surprised by how much autonomy we give them in the rehearsal. Sometimes it's, you know, you know, whatever you want, feel free to say, make this change or make that revision or what do you think? So I love that iteration process that we have with our composers and working in partnership with them. It's super rewarding. And I love that also uh, that what can be a very frustrating or difficult, challenging process, you also see it as the most fun part of the rehearsal because, you know, it can for... Some people, like, they can say, uh, yeah, changing a note or two. I already learned this or, you know, I don't want to try. But that's exciting. I feel that uh, me as a singer, too, you know, when we get to be in the the presence of composer or when the conductor says, you know, what if we try this like this? I mean, that those are uh, the most fun I have in rehearsal because... You know, you can totally fail and you say, mm, definitely <laughs> that doesn't work. But also you can discover something amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's in some ways I've, you know, I've told composers when they come work with us, I'm like, just view this, this space right now, this rehearsal space with these singers, with me, with you, this is just a giant sandbox. And we're just going to kind of experiment and see what works, what doesn't. And so sometimes reminding them that they have that permission to say, you know, I don't know if I like that. What, what do we, what if we try this and to hear it in live time? That iterative process is just really great. I love it. Has that always been a uh, part of your process to put a piece together or is something that you learned through this, through your journey? Honestly, it, we've always kind of started this way. I'm thinking back to our very first commission with Dale Trambor. She was the first composer that we commissioned in 2013. And premiered in 2014. She was at many of our rehearsals, and it was very much, you know, she was at pretty much all of our rehearsals, if I recall. And it was as small of things like, you know what, let's change that tempo marking to, oh, you know what, let's rewrite that chord, or I want to change the piano part there. It's always kind of been that way. And in fact, I would say when I when I trace our time over history, I've let go even more. So it's more of a really letting the composer take ownership of their piece and and letting them experiment if they want to, but then also gently guiding if they suggest something like, oh, I just don't see that working, you know, having that honest dialogue too. So yeah, I would say at least for Coral Arts Initiative's history and timeline, we've always had that approach of this is a collaboration. This is a partnership between composer and choral artist. And so we've always had that sort of experimental iterative approach. About this process, do you feel that is... Uh... Let's say, for example, if it's a composer that you don't know well, that you don't have a relationship with, is it a, an uncomfortable process or kind of a, you know, when, for example, somebody, someone says this doesn't work, is this something that's easily approachable or that? Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of, it's a it's an interesting question that you ask because I kind of think of it in a reverse way. Typically, the rela a relationship with the composer has already been established okay. by the time it gets to that point. So there's never been a concern or like a, an incredibly awkward situation where it's been like, oh, this is getting uncomfortable. It's always been there's been an established relationship before they are coming to work with the choir. So the only time that that's different is for our premier project festival, where we're bringing in composers from literally all over the world. Sadly, we had to cancel our upcoming summer festival because of the coronavirus and a lot yeah. of our international applicants just wouldn't be able to come. So uh, that, that can be a little bit more challenging because I don't necessarily have a relationship with those composers. And for some of the composers, it may be their very first time Uh, revising, editing, iterating with a chorus in live time. Mm -hmm. So there can be that bit of discomfort, but it's always approached through the lens of grace and, and knowing that it's a learning experience for everyone in the space. Uh, so that's the only time where it's a little bit different because I just don't necessarily know all the composers that come for our Premier Project Festival. And I feel it's a, a healthy to experience to go through that because we have to, you know, all learn about that process because if not we will just be i don't know an office composer who sends the music and disappears <laughs> right and you see yeah. what to do with that um it is I, i i always remember for example my time in university of houston when i got to do my graduation recital with uh moore school of music concert choral and dr weber 
And I remember that even some ideas came from the chorus from from the chorus singers, which uh, for some choirs might not be what's the word something that they are used to. You know that uh, listening to the singers' ideas for the performance of the piece, many many chorus you know are not maybe open to that or are scared of you know that being not so organized. But I just loved to hear the ideas of. Uh, that they had, whoa, what if we sing this like this? Or what if we do this slower? What do you think? It was an amazing um, experience for me. Would you say that in Choral Artist, in Choral Artist Initiative, uh, all of you work as a team to brainstorm kind of the possibilities that the piece can go to? Is it, what is the process to build this premiere? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the Choral Artists are all, you know, incredibly brilliant, talented musicians. And so they're a part of the process. They'll offer their feedback or ask questions. It's the composer, it's me, it's if Daniel's there, the assistant conductor, it's him. It's a very much, we're all, we're all contributing. And that's what makes our performances so special is that we all feel this personal ownership, not just to the music, but also to the composer, the living composer that's there in the space with us. So, yeah, it's very much a team approach as far as, as preparing works. Now, that said, it is a balance, right? It is yes. a team, but there is sort of, there is a team leader, uh, that being the artistic director. So, you know, I'm very comfortable with letting letting people in the space take ownership. But ultimately, if there's conflicts of opinions, there does need to be a little bit of mediation. And that's where I step in. Exactly. And that's uh, the great point of that, that it can be done if it's always with balance and with uh, an organization, you know, kind of, you know, people knowing what are the procedures to speak their mind. So that's great. Right. I, I just love to uh, learning about all of the process that goes into creating something like this, because I know that many in our audience might be thinking of either creating their ensemble or maybe they're part of an ensemble that wants to, evolve and that wants to try some new things and listen yeah. and listening from uh, such a thriving organization as yours it's great how do you see your place in the organization as you said you know you are taking the sabbatical to uh do you f what's your where, where do you see yourself going within the organization yeah so one of the things we're already we've already been talking about and in increasingly more detailed planning is our 10th anniversary season which is coming up in 2022 so that's one of the big things that i'm working towards now which is why i'm taking a sabbatical in the fall our season nine uh, just to take some time to really thoughtfully plan you know what does our season 10 look like and most importantly what are the next 10 years after that look like I love that. and you know just a, a rough sketch of course knowing that there's always going to be alters of course because we have that ability and we also have that culture of we value change we we embrace change and so as far as where do we go for the next 10 years i don't know if i'm ready to give mm, an answer exactly i know on that yet But I, I do know that our vision, I really love, it's, it's our North Star. It's our visions to be the world-class destination for new choral music, for composers, singers, and audience. And so with that, there's just so much, there's so many possibilities, and we're always dreaming up, you know, where could we go? What can we do? Now, of course, all of that has to be balanced and check with our budget. Of course. <laughs> so, you know, my job is, I view it, is to dream as much as I want and envision as much as I want. And then after that, take a look at the hard numbers, take a look at the data, take a look at the budget reports, and then see where we can find the middle ground. Yeah, it's all about the balance. And of course, the balance between not letting yourself not dream big enough because of the budget, but also not letting yourself get out of the budget because you have to think that you have to live through the concert and through the season. And I love right. how you mentioned that you're going to take the time to plan the next 10 years, to sketch the next 10 years, yeah. besides the big celebration of the 10th anniversary. Because many people can think that they have to have also definitive plans. And I've that's something that I've definitely learned in my career as a composer, that 
the first plan doesn't have to be I always wanted to you know this is the note that I'm putting in this piece and it has to stay there it has to be perfect and now <laughs> I'm so far from that I just think this is a first sketch and let's see where this goes but I'm opening yeah. the door and is that something that uh, you love doing or something that you you know most do and it's part of your job no I love doing it um you know, just, I think it's just my personality too. I just, I love to, to dream of things that could be or should be or, or mm -hmm. uh, can be and uh, love brainstorming. You know, what can we do that's not necessarily so different to the point where it's just not accessible to the average listener, mm -hmm. but what are some things that we can do to maybe just gently nudge the envelope? What are some things that we could do to gently challenge our audience? What are some things that we can do to gently challenge our singers? What are some things that can gently challenge me or the composer? So it's always thinking of that, um, that forward momentum. And, you know, we experimented with that with our audience. We did a, a concert that, you know, we, we feel like we know our listeners pretty well. We have a small but mighty following. You know, for us as a new music organization, if we can fill a, a hall with 200 people, that's a huge success. If we yeah. can get 200 people to come and sit through an hour of all brand new music that they've never heard before, you know, we can't lean on the marketing prowess of Brahms or Beethoven. You know, we can't market to these people, these, these composers that they may have never heard of before. So if we can get 200 people to consistently show up to our shows, that's a huge success for us. And so we're really cognizant of what they like, what they don't like, what they're comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with. And we're it's almost like it's another partnership with them to see, okay, this is an exchange here. So you really like this one. You didn't really like this one. What if we offered this and gave you this lens to view this piece through? So as far as the next 10 years, I really want to explore more into let's challenge what we define as, quote, good choral music. And let's also challenge that I consider to be an increasingly narrow definition of what, you know, air quote, new choral music means, what new music means. Yeah. And so there's just a lot of things that I'm really excited to explore. And again, I don't want to reveal anything too exactly. much yet. We'll save that for a, a season <laughs> 10 announcement. But there's just a lot of things that we're excited to take on. <laughs> I'm so excited to get there and to see a concert live and see it because it's an experience. Then it goes far beyond, as you say, you know, uh, then the choral performance becomes a playground and becomes this um, journey or ride of just new things and new ways of seeing what we all love that's choral music and I always love when performances become an experience because those are the ones that uh, I like to talk about I like to remember I like how I feel through those performances so what would be your recommendation or what would be one thing that you will love for a choral artist to know or do yeah so for what we look for with choral arts initiative and we hire very particular choral artists and we we really put a lot of weight on that that job title it's not just a singer you are a choral artist the biggest thing we look for is flexibility and persistence because we know that as a solely new music ensemble that's all we do that it's not always going to be easy music that you can just sight read off the page and sometimes it can create very high cognitive load and some singers may just get completely burned out or feel you know quite self low on the self-efficacy scale and so we're really looking for choral artists that are persistent and are up for the challenge and are willing to give it more than just one try to get it right So I would say, yeah, one thing we really look for a bit of advice is approach music making with flexibility. Um, and that that's that's for me a huge, a huge thing. It's really important. If it's something that should be, you know, like in a frame and here in my office. <laughs> yeah. Or a t-shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love that idea because as you said, uh it can be a hard process, but also a rewarding process. So Definitely yeah. being persistent on the on building this piece, then it will show. It it can be easy to be in a rehearsal and find yourself, you know, not either not giving enough because you're tired because something is not working, or just maybe that's not your specialty as a singer. Maybe you prefer to sing something that you will build easily or sight read 
easily. So, right, the- and that's something that we learned over time. You know, we were actually there was a time when we were in our second, third year where we were having very strong turnover in our roster. I would say upwards of fifty percent, sometimes even more. And I I couldn't help at the time but take it so personally, like, oh, they must not like singing for the organization. They must not like singing for me. And what I came to learn, uh, both in talking with some singers that chose to move on, was it just wasn't their cup of tea. They're just not, they're not looking to sing that kind of music. They want to go to an organization that's going to sing the major works, for example, or they want to go to sing in an organization that does a different type of, of musical aesthetic. And so Uh, now that we know kind of how to actually, and as part of the hiring and audition process, we're looking for the things that we value and to see if those values align. And so now our roster is at almost 90% retention, sometimes 100% from season to season. Uh, so that was definitely a huge thing that we learned. So it's a really good point that you brought up. How awesome. And to be able, as you said, to get to know your singers and get to know the people that you make music with because then you'll be able to serve them as much as you serve their art the, your audience and they will be able to serve you as an organization so it's mm-hmm. definitely a great advice that you're giving us here and i cannot think of a better way to close this interview and thank you so much brandon because i love everything that we learn from your journey but also from your advices sure it's been great See you in the next episode of the Happy Choir Podcast. <laughs> Ciao, people. Woo-hoo. You've been listening to the Happy Choir Podcast. For more information and show notes, visit thehappychoir.com. Happy <laughs> Choir.